Hello everyone, I'm Daniel Parto of Arendau, and today we have Amy Young, uh, ex Maker DAO, who's uh, part of leading community there and has done a bunch of amazing things in this space. And so I'm very happy to, to invite her to, to share a little bit about some of the lessons from scaling and decentralizing Maker. Uh, so over to you, Amy, if you'd like to share a little bit more about yourself or your trajectory or the framing or your talk, uh, it's all yours. Cool. Well, thanks first to, to have, have for having me. Um, I really like the collaborative nature of our DAO. So I'm really excited to share sort of like a little bit of the research that I've been working on for about a year on and off for a year. Um, and so first I want to say it is a, a research project that has been a, a long way through. So a lot of the text, it might be text heavy. And so I am going to share this presentation with everyone, the link to it, so you can go on your own time and do research. But like Daniel mentioned, please feel free to stop me, say, ask a clarifying question or anything like that, and we can go through any, um, through any of these. And so just like a quick intro about myself, I'm Amy Jung. And so um, I used to be at the head of community development at MakerDAO, which where a lot of the experience I had was sort of the dissolution of the foundation and then the, the growth of the DAO. And that was a really interesting time. My background is in design and operations. And so um, it was a really different kind of challenge I've had to do thinking about organization changes. Um, and one note I wanna make is that I'll, it, this is not so helpful in a Zoom call or like a video call like this, but um, you'll see these little QR codes on the bottom left hand. You'll see um, they'll be kind of placed around. Those are actually scanned to the references that I might make on um, on one of the researches, and it'll just link you to like a web, like an article or things like that. Um, so um, before I get started, um, I think a lot of the things that uh, give you a little context about why um, I, I started to do this um, when I kind of finished, uh, sort of left at Maker. One of the things I, I realized is I really want to reflect on everything that we learned from this transition of doing like a full, fully from uh, like from even the years of leading up to Maker's development. And I realized there that I started to kind of think about how um, a lot of these teams are going to go through this transition and how we can build like a resource that allows other people to utilize that in their own organization. And so this is ultimately a resource for builders by builders. Um, when I was starting, I was, you know, thinking about like, what's a DAO, what isn't a DAO? It was originally supposed to be a DAO playbook. And I realized it's not as important for me to define that because it really depends on why you want to define a DAO. And so if somebody is a lawyer, they might be interested in defining a DAO so that they can clarify why an entity, how that entity might um, work with an, something like a DAO. And so that might be make sense, but maybe somebody who wants to just collect something as a group, it doesn't really matter why they have to know such details about what is and what isn't a DAO. And so I decided to take two, a more focused lens. So the two things are that I really define DAOs in the context of an internet native organization. And I'll talk a little bit about that and why open networks are kind of linked to that. And then the third and uh, the kind of like third kind of piece to this is that I focus specifically on this transition process from what I call closed le or legacy. So like, you know, a, a Twitter or even a company that starts in the beginning to this decentralized process, because what I believe is that when you want to become A to B, you make these decisions and there are certain catalysts in, in these decisions that define like, OK, I don't want to be centralized or I don't want to, to kind of have this goal. And in those decisions, I think if we start to gather those, those will define the decisions that people make to define what a DAO, what their DAO means and what it doesn't mean. So those are kind of the two main lenses that I want to kind of give context to. And so I wanna pause here because my research is kind of comprised of these three components. One was just about monolithic versus network building, which is a lot about why building in this kind of context is very different than how we used to build or how we build companies today. And then the second piece is around um, kind of decentralization and sort of the surprising aspects that people um, think about when they think about community ownership and, and, and decentralization. And the third piece is really like a step-by-step -step guide. I call it progressive decentralization 2.0 um, because it really takes 
sort of the learnings that Jesse Walden did a while ago and start to really influence by the learnings at Maker of like, okay, what actually happened on each of these steps and what can what's changing today? Um, but I want to pause here and I just want to ask the group because it's going to be too much for me to go through the whole thing. Um, I'm curious, there's kind of two, two pieces I can break it up into. If you're interested in more of the kind of like network mindset and sort of like the how to build some, like what's the context in which you should be thinking the mindset or first principles, or if you're interested in like the super hyper practical of like at each step, this is what it looks like. And we can dig into that piece a little bit more. I'm curious if in this group, because I'm also super grateful that you've come and like actually joined, um, if either of those resonate more. Um, so the first, so you can either raise your hand or put it in the chat. If you're more interested in sort of the first principles thinking, the, the idea of open network, can you raise your hand? And Daniel, this is where you have to help me uh, let me know what the, <laughs> the ratio split is. Cool. And then if you're more interested in the second half, which is just like very specific, practical um, step-by-steps. Oh, Daniel, you're muted. Uh, that explains a lot. We have uh, two versus two. Uh, <laughs> <so far. laughs> Okay. All right. Then I will try to be condensed and sort of slid it. Um, again, it's a lot of stuff that has been like months of research. So I might go through some pieces really quickly and kind of brush off of it, but um, I'm happy to go back and you can also ask me questions afterwards. And so um, I, I like to really think about why the difference between these two things, uh, what our favorite like Donella Meadows about um, kind of systems thinking. There's this amazing uh, kind of piece on places to intervene in a system when you're trying to essentially create some change. And this is ultimately what progressive decentralization is. You're, you're trying to create change while the system is moving. And so she kind of lists this whole, you know, steps this is actually her original one. And then she, she ended up editing it. And I kind of like the original one better. But the first step is like, how do you, you have to change the mindset or paradigm of a system. And this will create the most impact if you create this kind of change. And so the second one is goals of the system. The third one is um, this idea of like, how to kind of change or like have the power to the people or the power to kind of self-organize. And so the, the kind of why of why I do this monolithic thinking versus sort of network thinking, I like to start there because it is the most impactful once you start to really recognize that this is a very different space for building and a, a big opportunity to kind of rethink how we might move forward in this kind of like Web3 paradigm. And so um, this I'm going to brush over a little bit because the main thing I think you've probably heard this before a lot of the like industrial revolution thinking comes from this idea of streamlining and kind of mass scaling. And then the kind of internet renaissance and what the inter internet has brought us is like this idea of digital assets and particularly global communities. And so when we think about industrial thinking, we really rely on this idea of information and resource as in a competitive space. So you have to be the most efficient way to, to build something. And an example I give is that there's kind of autonomous cars right now. Google, Apple, everyone's building their own type of autonomous cars and keeping very secretive and siloed with each other. And this in itself creates sort of that innovation, but also each of these organizations are looking to be the most efficient as pos possible to grow as fast as possible. So there's this idea of efficiency, speed, competition, which is what you'll hear a lot today or about a lot of the building today. But then what we see today is this explosion of crypto, right? And why did it grow so fast? How does it grow so fast? And when you think about sort of internet native uh, context, it's really about coordination and self-organization. And so when you think about Wikipedia, the reason that the content and um, kind of what exists today has grown is because there are a group of individuals who come together and create rules and define and how to kind of grow this uh, resource for a majority of others. And so that's sort of the main takeaway I'd love for everyone to think about of sort of how we then shift 
into recognizing what an open network looks like and how collaborative networks work. And um, this is sort of the piece that I like to think about, which is there's sort of like three main components. So first is this idea that we are able to democratize production and distribution of information. And so anybody could create a blog, anyone could tweet, there's kind of this freedom and actually the distribution is, the scaling of the distribution is so far and global. And so this idea of information wants to be free, when it becomes free, what happens is there's a lot of um, transparent information out in the space where people can learn or learn about anything essentially. And so that combined with this idea of um, peer to peer, this is how peer to peer is then Create, gets created is that the idea that um, it's we have each other to kind of check in with each other what, with this information that we have. And what happens is when, when we have peer to peer processes that are no longer kind of that are available to a majority, this type of open sharing actually grows a lot more fat, like grows networks at a much faster scale that we see. And all of these things we've seen in crypto today. And so um, we think about sort of the, this idea of our printing press version of crypto, which is Twitter. And here we have this really deep ability to spread and disseminate critical, critical information, including information, how to coordinate, how we're going to start something. And, and so this kind of type of speed of information and distribution of information then feeds into this idea that everyone has access to it. So how can we utilize that access to create more peer-to-peer -peer, um, checks and balances? And at Maker, we have something called collateral onboarding. And so every time a token goes into um, to kind of become a collateral for the, the Maker protocol, it um, the kind of collateral onboarding team created this kind of assessment that's sort of like a step-by-step -step guide where anybody can audit or review the token itself. And there's a consistent form in which everyone can kind of do this auditing process. And also the process itself can always be audited. And so the, to the right is an example of someone from the community who kind of came in and, and did a, a presentation or did an audit of a, the assessment of a token. And if somebody kind of comes in and multiple people can do this with the same token, for example, and so this is kind of, you're starting to see the, the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. And we can even see this in actually organizational building. And so a core unit is a kind of um, like a team in at Maker. And anybody can go ahead and propose a team. And anyone on the other side can also make uh, sort of uh, comments about why or why not this team should be onboarded. And so on the right, you see that there is a... Um, there was kind of a de delegate who wanted to, who believed that we shouldn't onboard this one team and states X, Y, Z reason. And so again, this is the peer to peer kind of checks and balances that we see that is through the freedom of information where everyone, everything is available to essentially um, everybody who sees it. And so the last piece is kind of this network network. And I like to kind of give this example of all these kind of different protocols and what um, people think have in common. And it's actually not DeFi, it's actually uh, Monet Supply, which is, uh, he's like one of the top delegates of all these kind of organizations. And an example of something where he goes to, uh, he was a risk, he worked on the team at risk, and he takes those kind of lessons and, and what the team does and actually started a, a team in Aave. And it's kind of like going, working at Google and am, at Amazon at the same time in a Web2 context, you'd never be able to do that. But in this context, it's actually building a bigger kind of bridge between these different protocols that have different value propositions. And so kind of going into the goals of the system, um, this is where I, I, my personal favorite part, um, everyone always gets really scared when they think about decentralization that there is, it's very binary. But in reality, there's so many layers to decentralization. What does decentralization look like on a technical level? Um, what does it look like on an authority level? So on an organizational level, um, it, you can have sort of different spectrums for different things. And um, ultimately, it's also not 
not, you know, none or all you can't, I think maker is an example of a team that wants to be fully, fully decentralized from the technical stack to the organizational stack. But most teams you'll see aren't that interested in this. And so it's really about understanding why you want the community to be involved and then how you want them to be involved. And then what are they owning? What, what kind of responsibility, what kind of ownership do they have in this network or anything that you're building? And a good example I'd like to start with is um, this amazing uh, researcher, author, Nadia, who um, has this amazing book, I really recommend it, Working in Public, that talks about sort of the history of open source and sort of its struggles and, and so on. But one of the best things is uh, this kind of model that she talks about where there's kind of the number of contributors or people who are helping build something and a number of people using or kind of absorbing or consuming something. And in the example of like a federation, this is essentially where there's a really big amount of users contributing to something. So anyone who's inputting um, an, an um, a article inside of Wikipedia, but then there's also a num high number of users. It's never going to be equal, but it's the idea of this ratio being quite high. And when we also think about Ethereum at large, you know, there's a ton of people building on Ethereum as a whole. And so we start to think, think about these federations in that level versus if we go to the bottom stadiums, um, there's sort of a stadium is when there's sort of a smaller team of core contributors and then there's a high volume of users utilizing it. So the Geth team, for example, is a very small core contributing team in Ethereum that a lot of people rely on Geth as like a, a client to kind of utilize. And in the end, if that is the desired state and you want to stay in that stadium, that's okay too. But it's good to have these conversations about understanding where you want to move to. And a lot of teams that I work with go from this idea of a stadium. They want to kind of go from this small core group into this larger federation where there are more contributors and there's more ownership of the users and kind of brings the number of users contributors to, to one area. And so that kind of leads us to why people might decentralize. Um, and so the one I there's a few that I, I kind of seen in some of the research and the first one's exponential growth. So there's a huge opportunity that you can just scale. So Wikipedia is the example I keep giving, but also if you're following a lot of DeFi things, Curve is one where people create strategies and those strategies are created by um, individuals in the network. And so by creating better swap strategies, and I think a lot of DeFi does this, um, it actually creates value at a scale versus an individual team or a person that is developing these kind of um, different aspects of it. Then the most popular one, which is, you know, the Sushi and uh, Un uh, Uniswap situation is that people get scared that they're going to lose market share because there's going to be essentially a, a, a decentralized version of whatever they're creating that will then create uh, take the full of networks so it becomes very offensive and defensive and then the the this is actually quite popular where um mostly i see because founders are sort of burnt out and they're ready to share more ownership with a group of people who also want value to the platform um, but nathan schneider did a more formal kind of concept of exit to community where he talks about how, um, for example, in the context of Twitter, there was a time where Twitter was really trying to, was not making any revenue. And there was a bunch of people who were really excited to be shareholders of Twitter. Um, and so they were really thinking about doing this kind of uh, community buyout. Um, it didn't happen, obviously, but it's moments like this where it does make sense that perhaps there is um, an equal, there's a way to kind of go to the community to kind of share that value. And then the last one, which is very popular, uh, is regulatory compliance, which is really about decentralizing operations. Obviously, nobody wants to get papers from the SEC or, or anything like that. So there might be um, just a desire to reduce dependency on these efforts. And so most teams will have maybe one, two, all of these reasons of why they want to decentralize. And that becomes sort of a catalyst of why they want to go on to this next journey. And this is when you start thinking about multi-part, what I call multi-party ownership. And so really, essentially, we all come together and why DAOs are created or is for a variety of reasons. You might just want to create, um, you want to make investments. Maybe you want to manage decentralized protocols, or maybe you want to create 
um, you want to collect uh, NFTs, right? So it really, the way that we organize really depends on what we want to build. And this is super important to think about because the structure of the ownership can vary. So it's not that you have to be a full DAO. I really believe that the Web3 is about optionality. And so you can have these kind of, you'll see sometimes you'll have a sole team that's just like a company. I think I heard some folks here today who are, you know, they're kind of a company that they want to create into this open network and are thinking about the middle grounds to that. So then you might have a two org. So when Maker uh, was sort of, we still had the foundation, we had the foundation and the DAO. Um, some are just only DAO from the beginning. Th what we see more today is this idea of multi-team or sub DAO. So you have multiple entities in one organization um, kind of moving in and out. And um, in this way, I started to really think about, well, when you have these different kind of components, you can kind of create your own stack. So you can have different decision-making styles for, for different kinds of organizations. So um, when you have a sole team, obviously a lot of that is very closed. It's just your core team developing it. So it doesn't really need a lot of like public processes, for example. And so a lot of those might be internal decisions. And a lot of that funding might be private or institutional. But when you start to get two organizations, like I mentioned, there's an entity and a DAO. So Compound is an example of, a, a, there's a Compound DAO, which are token holders, and then Compound Labs itself. What happens is there's distributed kind of dis decision-making. So the lab might be creating something that's a little bit more different, or that they might be building something on behalf of the DAO that starts to create um, proposals that defines what they want to build based on that. And then um, sort of a lot of what we see on these transitional DAOs, which are kind of like radical Gitcoin element, um, Gnosis used to be here, but actually now moved to this multi-party DAO as they're really finishing their um, like transition process. A lot of it is sort of this idea that um, there is a core team and they're just trying to give out more, uh, they're trying to engage with the community to then take more ownership. And so in this process in itself, there's usually a token drop to then distribute more ownership that then allows them to create treasuries um, and grant programs that allow to kind of grow, grow this um, group. I think the crypto native, which I'm less familiar with, but there's really, really interesting um, engagement there where we start to see a lot of um, sort of like, like uh, groups that just kind of form through mandates and how like their social contracts are tied with technical contracts. And so, um, and, and how product is developed through that. So um, Wiren is really interesting where they have this whole list of different products that different community teams create. And essentially they aggregate those things to create one Wiren world um, essentially. Um, and then the multi-party organization is one that you see at Maker where there's a lot of these different um, aggregated kind of groups but you'll have decision like councils or delegates are really popular. And then you'll have community members, you'll have teams, um, you'll have different teams that um, kind of form different units essentially. And then um, we see a lot that, that after the treasury, the, the revenue from the treasury is what funds these organizations because it becomes quite large to be able to do it in a distributed way. Um, and then, so the, the kind of last part is this very, very um, practical step. And so, uh, you know, as I mentioned with Jesse Walden's like progressive decentralization, which I heard a few of you guys are familiar with, is just this process in which founding teams relinquish control by degrees over time. And in this uh, writing, he really talks about these three components. There's a product market fit phase, there's a community participation phase, and then at some point there's sufficient decentralization and that process is over, the, the progressive piece is over and there's decentralization. But actually from what I've learned, there's actually like, I took that and, and kind of pulled that a little bit more by describing these different components, which is bootstrapping, growth, transition, autonomy, and then scale. And the bootstrapping phase is pretty clear. Everybody's pretty familiar. It's really about product market fit. There's a core team that's develop, delivering something. You're essentially just trying to create um, a purpose and, and value for people to understand why this thing is so, so important that it needs to exist. 
And when, when we start to think about the next phase, which is about growth, I really, really love this piece from Peter where he really talks about this phase is about this long-term focus on community building. If you're going to have a network that is owned by multi-parties or the, you know, including kind of community members, you have to start thinking about how to build in a way that starts to bring those people together because ownership is just giving a token to someone doesn't define ownership. It's that you want people to be more involved with responsibilities. But if you don't, if you give responsibilities without um, kind of telling them like what, what, why that exists, you've kind of lost, you've lost to kind of speculative movements. And so growth to me is the most important piece. This is where a lot of the, I, I think teams skip over this really quickly because you're really trying to look for contributors that are really, really core. Um, and so, but to start in the beginning, a lot of teams just kind of create these documentations. It's pretty straightforward. You have your community calls. I would say this is the most um, consistently, like you can, how to start a community 101. There's a lot of resources out there for this, including grant programs. There's hackathons, you know, um, how to create these resources, um, how to like finding a head of community and so on. And I kind of spoke about this kind of speculative aspect of it. Um, I would like to give this example of, of Gitcoin in the early days when it launched its token. And essentially what happened was they were gifted a bunch of these tokens from Vitalik. And um, it was such a significant amount that if they try to sell it, it would essentially destroy this Akita. This Akita token would essentially destroy their DAO, the Akita like DAO. And so... It, this kind of created a lot of tension between what the DAO, Gitcoin DAO should do next. But at the same time, Gitcoin, uh, the Gitcoin DAO was really, really early. So this group of thousands of people who received these tokens have never worked together to solve a problem like this before. And so it was really interesting to kind of see how to build a win-win situation in which how do you self-organize a team to figure out these solutions? And then how do you, um, how do you um, execute on those things? And so that's a reason that I believe growth is also really important. You really have to, growth is how do you bring a community together where they start to define like share values together that, so that when a time like this comes, you're per more prepared because you have a sense of shared language or understanding. And there's different ways that you could kind of measure community and so on. And so the, the next phase is transition. And this is sort of the part where you're preparing for that transition into becoming more of a decentralized organization. And here, the, mo the biggest focus is that you want to create something that focuses on the successful maintenance um, and kind of incentivize sustainable operations. So it's really, really long term. Whatever you design here should be able to support sort of the mid to long term because this is going to kind of pull from what the original team worked on. And then it's going to kind of scale that um, into larger than life. And so right here, really the indicator is that there's even just like a hundred true fans, people who are just so obsessed. They, they come on the discord there. They just want to know they might not be contributing anything directly, but they're so, so um, impressed and, and want to be engaged in this network that they show up all the time. And then you also start to see that the project itself starts running kind of more open project, uh, open source. So um, you might have uh, outside contributors starting to do it. A lot of um, a lot of the product development starts to kind of think about how do you do this externally and a little bit more publicly. And I mentioned there's a lot of more proactive contributors. And this is when public processes start to kind of come together. And and so in that sense, there's um, some of the practical side of what that looks like for you to build on that is that you can start to see that there's more formalized processes. So like the creation of sort of proposals, how does the proposal work? How do people vote on something even if it's off chain? Um, there's a lot of working groups that are really great because they essentially create proto teams that allow you to see like, does this team work out and should they be more formalized team for the future? Um, and then a lot of the core team, they're more focused on sort of sharing knowledge, less. Um, less on like building because at this point they're trying to scale the con contributors. Um, and what's something really interesting in the example I give here about urine finance is 
I see this a lot where the community starts to build a newsletter because there's so much happening and the inform like stakeholders have to get become have specific information towards them so that they're best educated in whatever decision they're making. And so we start to sort of see that there's these clear sort of next steps preparing for this transition of power. And there's still a lot of innovation that's been been working on, um, you know, that even the uh, creation of Snapshot as a tool has been really game changing in how we kind of come to decisions and kind of collectively make those, as well as there's programs like Radical had their liquidity um, program, their token liquidity program. And so there's a lot of stuff that's still being built, but we are now starting to see sort of the best practices form in that sense. And then in um, autonomy, this is sort of what you start to really see. This is essentially what Maker really went through in this stage. And um, it's essentially what, how you know you're kind of in this phase is that there's no platform, uh, you've kind of like mitigate the platform risk because the ownership is kind of distributed to multiple parties uh, and they're operated by multiple parties. And that means there's no single entity with asymmetric information. So one company doesn't have information that is that is going to essentially um, drive a, a project one way. That information is distributed or public. Um, a big indicator is that the protocol or the, the DAO can sustain itself financially. I think that is a really key indicator for people to be able to work for the DAO as well. Um, and then we start to see that admin keys are either burned or there's some kind of protocol for how those admin keys are managed. Um, and then this idea of the user and owner or um, that I talked about with Nadia's model, there's a lot more alignment between that. So people are both using the protocol or using the product, but they're also feeling a sense of ownership and therefore starting to build um, more responsibilities towards that. And so on that sense, there's now a compensation framework. So you'll see more things. You'll see like the ossified decision-making. So governance, um, like there's clear governance processes. Um, there's a lot of work between cross teams and teams are just trying to figure out how to best work together. Um, and there's a lot of kind of like public reporting. So in the context of Maker, there's a team that publishes monthly reports on um, how much the DAO is spending, how much the DAO um, is, is about to spend, how much, um, what are the kind of different teams that exist. And these things become more and more clear in the organization. And the last bit is scale, which since I started the organization a lot, uh, since I started this research has grown a lot um, because this was about a year ago. And now we see a lot of more DAO to DAO interaction just because there are more DAOs. And so what's interesting about this part is that the DAO starts to kind of take on its own growth cycle um, where previously the founders might be focused on sort of, um, you know, finding a purpose, the DAO has started to redesign its own um, kind of systems and how things work. And so it might be branding, rebranding itself. It might be thinking about different strategies. Um, there's kind of engagement with other organizations and other DAOs to kind of grow the organization itself. Um, and the teams are mostly, you know, working autonomously. And so I'll leave it with this one piece. I'm working on sort of a better framework to kind of fill this in. Um, but essentially, each of these in each of these phases, there's change and, and kind of challenges in every kind of uh, segment. And so um, in the case of like people things, it, the, the people side changes as this kind of um, process moves forward to from bootstrapping to autonomy. And so does sometimes the funding. If you launch a token, it's very different from if you had raised a private round in the bootstrapping phase. Um, maybe you might have closed admin privileges in the decision-making process, but then they start to change quite a bit when you have more token voting, for example. And so I'll, I'm going to share a better version of this. This is still a work in progress, um, but we're kind of hoping to create a framework that allows teams to kind of see the bigger picture of what's happening. And then last bit is what can go wrong. Um, I think the main thing is that sometimes there's just uh, a lot of... Uh, First, the growth phase, um, when there's sort of 
too early, there's a token distribution. So there's a lot of like speculative people um, before there's actually true infrastructure for community members to take ownership. Um, a lot of it is that there's kind of like decentralized theater where they're, the community says that they're, that they're, the team say that there's um, sort of decentralized, but actually the core teams end up doing everything themselves. Um, and sometimes, you know, teams have just not found product market fit and they want to just get really excited to launch a token. And that also kind of can hinder a team from kind of moving forward. And so um, with that, sorry, this is quite long, but um, that's that's sort of the, the kind of research that I've been doing. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Amy, for, for sharing this uh case study and, and the framework on progressive decentralization. If anyone has any questions, feel free to, to raise the hand. Uh, you can use this hand or just raise a hand. I'll pass over to you. Uh, and, and if not, otherwise I have a, a bunch of questions I'm curious to ask, but I'll, I'll give you a few seconds to decide if there is something you'd like to start with. Edwin. Um, well, first of all, thank you for doing this research. It is sorely needed um, in, in trying to understand, Daniel and I were talking about this the other day, like what's the playbook when you're in the bootstrapping phase and you want, you've read the Jesse's article and you, you read the one that came out recently about kind of open decentralization. You're like, okay, yeah, this is, this is the way we want to go. It's what we want to do. There's a whole bunch of, decisions that you need to make in that initial bootstrapping almost setup phase and you you there was a great chart that you showed that which had a number of different um models ultimately that you could use and you know the one where maker was at the right what what would be your tips for um yeah this this one how founders um, initial kind of genesis team should be thinking about the decision of which of these, let's say five or more models to consider the pros and cons. Is there other resources? Um, I just did the deep, deep dive in, in, into brain trust this week. And there's been, I think a few success stories with different models, but yeah, that, that's, that's where I'm just really struggling right now is trying to find all the different kind of best practices or mental models to use when making these early stage decisions. Mm. Yeah, and I think that that's the um, why I want to have people like take it piece by piece of, you know, think about because there's so many challenges on each of these segments as you're moving forward. Um, that the, First of all, this is like the reason I wanted to create this framework that's in work in progress where people can just see out big picture and then um, and then be able to say, okay, like which section are we are we really thinking about? And then um, what I was trying to create was that, the, for example, uh, what happens in purple is what happens when you launch a token, which of these pieces get affected and change in each of these segments. Um, and so I think there's ways you can iterate like workshop through, okay, if this happens, how are each of these segments affected and how does that change from our early model? Obviously you can't know everything, but um, sometimes it's okay to just go step by step, like in the, literally going like, okay, we're right now in the growth phase. What we should really focus on is how do we get contributors um, at to as much as we can that are aligned with our, our current needs because sometimes that's it because so much changes, especially in this change, this space that you might be planning to create a, a, a tool that you know is created a year later and you're like, oh, we spent all this time trying to create this tool. Sometimes it makes sense. I think when you look at Maker, we had all very, um, because we felt like Maker was very unique, created our own thing for everything, like its own contract, own voting mechanism, we created everything. And I think this is what Daniel and, and was kind of also working on with Arne Dow as well, which is what are the different models people can use? Like how can you mix and match so you don't have to start from scratch? And then just trying to play around with what makes sense for your own, your own organization and asking really these tools, like 
what purpose, what was the intention that they're using it for? What use case are they using it for? Because it might not fit into the thing that you're trying to use. Um, or if there is, if they're early and they can collaborate with you to create more of a, a special like version of the feature, then that's possible too. So I, I think it's more about, I would personally take it step by step because each of these have so much things. And then you can always workshop what it looks like and see it in practice at a later time. That's, that's helpful. I, I just, I find it so at the bootstrapping phase, we're very comfortable with the web two models of VC mm -hmm. and what, what, what is it that you need to show in terms of traction in order to get VC? That makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense. It's a, it's a tried and true playbook um, mm -hmm. for web two. But what I'm seeing is you have all of these potential bootstrapping core founders who know the web two playbook for getting money and traction, mm -hmm. but they don't know what the web three playbook mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. for, you know, should we be plan like just write a white paper and then plan to raise, you know, money via a token before a generation event? And should we join one of these seed accelerators or incubators? Yeah. Um, should we even be thinking about creating equity in our thing, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is it just a protocol that doesn't is not a legal entity that we're building, and then the thing we're going to own is a client that interacts mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. There's just so much complexity mm -hmm. there, and I, I mean, I don't want to take up all the airtime here, but whatever whatever you figure out uh, in terms of tools to help people work through those questions and decisions in that bootstrapping phase is incredibly valuable in my my opinion yeah and that was actually so i'm um have a grant now to kind of actually do more uh hands-on research that brings case studies but essentially i the other counter to to the one that i showed earlier is what are the challenges just like what are the challenge challenges that you see in each of these segments and i'm working on how we document that so that we can just say hey like you said a lot of teams are really struggling with um, understanding what, you know, how to, like, should we launch a token right away? Should we wait? You know, like, these are all questions that I think we're still trying to figure out. So I definitely don't have the full answers. I can sort of, I think we're all working on capturing some of the use cases. At the same time, we're still doing a lot of experimentation. And I, I still encourage experimentation. Like, Element Finance recently did their um, token launch. And they finally did something that I've been waiting for, which is uh, zero knowledge, uh, you know, claiming. So your your you claiming tokens don't, aren't tied to your Ethereum address, which is why sometimes I can't vote on certain things because then it will expose my entire uh, kind of bags, as they say, right? And so there's little incremental things that I think people are doing when they think about the challenges that affect them and then they find problems with. And so we're still doing that piece right now. Um, that's why I was also very uncomfortable with creating a playbook a like ASAP because I don't think those things are defined too much. But like you said, the first part, the bootstrapping, that's pretty clear. Next one is growth. I think there's a lot of resources there that we're building. That transition piece is what I'm trying to build up a bit more on what that looks like. Yeah, kind of to, to, to echo on that, our, our experience is very much that is such an early stage still in the ecosystem. And a lot yeah. of the ideas or theories I had four months ago just no longer apply because uh, there are different tools and systems and approaches yeah. that have come up since that just completely obliterate them. We're still very much in a first principle stage. Uh, but the, but it's cool. Like I'm, I'm, I'm already starting to see how multiple paths uh, map well to this progressive decentralization path. While at the same time, with like initiatives like Arendelle, we're exploring a more, let's say, decentralization first, uh, first approach. And and I guess it's, there's a lot to be gained by the dialogue between between both sides where we are experiencing a lot of the pains of like, we're trying to do everything at the same time. Uh, but that's also the, the learning opportunity, which in our case makes sense because we're just trying to generate learning as, as an output more than anything else. Um, but for a protocol would perhaps be too, tra too challenging to try decentralization first on, well, who knows if they can pull it off, uh, maybe it leads to faster exponential growth, but that's, I guess, and I, a hypothesis I'm very curious to test. I don't know, Amy, if you've seen uh, something in that in that direction, or like if you've seen some examples of 
uh, let's say, successful decentralized first networks? Mm. Um, I, th I think I wrote, I mean, it becomes a very nuanced answer because then it's like, what is decentralized, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but for example, like sushi, I think is a really interesting, like it's a very crypto, I would say crypto native, like that's the word I would use. So to me, sushi is an example of like a crypto native organization that really focused like you know there's an unfound it introduced this idea of anon founders of incentives like token incentives and um it gone through a lot of its own organizational shift and things like that um and I, I think it's at the same place that we see sometimes teams that were centralized from the beginning but it borrowed a lot of the like value proposition from something that was already existing so it didn't really need to do that bootstrapping phase the same way that uniswap had to build that initial phase if that makes sense and so it, sometimes like i see teams moving like crypto native teams just moving faster through these phases and that's just because they're they don't have to build everything from scratch like they're maybe using the network effect as sort of a um as like a, a fire starter yeah thank you any any other questions uh that someone else might have, or even Edwin, if you have more. Oh, good to see you, Seth, even though, I mean, we're not seeing you, but. <laughs> hey, Seth, please go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was mainly just gonna say, hi, Amy, it's great seeing you again. I remember you uh, from Maker, uh, like, uh, doing some source cred stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and which has been a really cool experience. So Seth is from um, source cred and we worked uh, together with source cred to kind of create sort of a reward system for governance participants. And we want to see what as an experiment, what that would look like. Um, and it, that was really interesting. A lot of people ask us about, ask me about it today, about how that went and whether they should use source cred for their organization. What was that the incentivization of the maker forum for proposals and mm -hmm, discussion? Mm -hmm. So it was yeah. just to kind of see if people who to kind of reward, I think there's a difference between incentivize and reward. And we were trying to avoid incentivizing people to, to participate, but more like rewarding them for doing something like, you know, writing quality posts or um, being active in, in a way. And so we worked very closely with the source grad team to really create the parameters for which we could experiment on that. Um, but I, I know a lot of teams are thinking about, for example, like proposals for good proposals, but then it becomes very like, there's a lot of game theory based on, on, on stuff like that. So sometimes keeping it simple is, is good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Edwin, go for it. Well, if no one else is going to ask questions, then I'm going to ask a question. Um, Amy, and in one of your slides, you you when in the bootstrapping, which is obviously the phase that I'm most interested in. You know, you said the initial funding is often you know either gotten through angels or private or VCs. Uh, um, I've just been, spent some time looking at all the the different various Web three seed accelerators, right? You know, we've got Seed Club and Alliance and Stacker and Coinlist and Outlier. Um, and then there's this, there's this element of, of, um, how do you get that initial funding while having the plan of ultimately being as decentralized as we possibly can, but, you know, like the progressive decentralization article says, well, you want to have a, that core motivated team initially to find the, the product market fit. I'm just wondering what general advice do you have as to how to navigate that stage of, of getting an initial funding and if there's any particular programs or people or whatever that you think are doing this particularly well in terms of getting ultimately to that decentralized um, endpoint. Mm, um, I mean, first, I, I definitely d would say I probably shouldn't be giving advice on this because I personally never, you know, launched uh, my own startup. So this is just more from just observation. Um, I still see it the same in the beginning phases of bootstrapping. You're just trying to, again, prove product market fit. And that's what people want to see. 
And a lot of teams, I see them creating sort of the intention, like, okay, we're going to have a, a token more kind of thing. Don't worry. like, you know, we are going to launch a token eventually. Right. And that's very common now these days. And so sometimes with the VCs, I see them just doing both at the same time. It's equity and then this token, future tokens, um, which I think become very nuanced once they launch a token. So I've seen teams be like, okay, yeah, we're going to do it. And then you really have to think about token economics of why that makes sense. Because ultimately, like when you see something like, I think Gnosis is a very specific example because it's kind of like, split into different components um but when you're kind of like thinking about what you need to grow i think that's different than what you need to grow ownership if that makes sense mm -hmm. and the funding you need i think a lot of there's a lot of overvaluation going on right now because it's very easy to to get funding i i predict that there's going to be sort of a slowdown in that because we're going to start to see like companies fail. And I think that in the bootstrapping phase, we forget that there's still a lot of like space for you to fail and that it might not work out. And so you're just trying to build, I would say, if you're trying to build something high quality, you don't need that much money. You don't need all these tokens. You don't need something complicated. You're just trying to, again, find that product market fit. And when you go there, you can then also think about that token. Um, economics unless the token economics is literally built into your network right like play to earn is like very built in so you might want to do something differently if you're thinking about games mm. yeah i think it sort of depends on really what you're trying to build and how it's integrated into that that being said i hope there's more like more research on token economics like models and designs that's a that's a big one to go through. Yeah. <laughs> big chapter. Super interesting what the, in that sense, what the common stack are doing, starting to productize a token economics model mm, with mm. the augmented bonding curve as a, as a product. I don't know mm. if you've seen much of that. Uh, I haven't, but I heard really good things about it. So I have to check that out. Yeah, they, they're they're starting now. Like they they just launched the the token engineering uh, commons as a first sort of common that's yeah. bring off the common stack, and and now actually they have a prize for like a sort of contest where they will incubate the next uh, the next commons. They they mm -hmm. were actually suggesting to Arundel that we apply. We're we're having some questions there because well that that aligns us with a certain uh, stack and hence a certain community and and we still haven't decided which ecosystem to position ourselves in but yeah i see that that being really hard to like deciding early on on the end like first obviously like a good example is like chain right if you're going to be multi-chain evm compatible i see a lot of teams just doing evm compatible so that in the future they can if there's they want to be on other chains but really uh, these are all yeah challenges that in the end it is unfortunately like your team has to decide if it's right fit or not based on what you what you're creating the same as when you think about partnerships and sort of the right partners to be involved um it is a very time consuming process i think to to, to create something that makes sense for um long term or short term yeah, that's been kind of like one one big struggle that we we had at the beginning, where we wanted to take this super collaborative approach, as you know, and and we started to go to all of these organizations, and actually got told by some of them is like, don't do too many partnerships. We, we'll be on board mm -hmm. only if it's us and one more, maximum. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that we kind of like stop to some degree trying to be so partnership oriented from the beginning, mm -hmm. and. And now are more thinking in a in a customer focused way uh, rather let, let's let's go to them but sell to them rather than partner which i think is kind of like a shame but it, it was is mm. becoming just too much of an uphill battle mm. yeah well amy we're uh we're up on time if you have any closing words i'll pass it on to you otherwise if anyone wants to uh check out the recording of the event we'll we'll share it in the twitter and discord and we can also continue the conversation there so i share both in the chat and 
Amy, thanks a lot uh, for coming here thanks and sharing with us. Really me. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. This is my first time doing this publicly, so <laughs> appreciate the feedback. Very exciting. So you saw it. You saw it here first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Take care. Have a lovely rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining, everybody. Thank you.